Chronic adrenal fatigue is dismissed in traditional endocrinology. But what happens when you feel all the symptoms and your doctor is dismissive? As with anything else in the health world, there are nuances to adrenal fatigue and what ultimately matters is how you feel. In today's episode, we will answer three questions. What are the three stages of adrenal fatigue? How do we know which stage we are in? How can we move past any of the stages of adrenal fatigue? Stephanie is a physician's assistant and functional medicine nutritionist. She specializes in helping high-performing women with anxiety, chronic stress and burnout reclaim their lives. And she has worked her own way through her battles with anxiety. Let's get started. Hey everyone, I'm Deepa, Light Functional Medicine Practitioner, Author and Yogini and you're listening to the Sleep Whisperer Podcast, the only sleep podcast with conversations and meditations. I'm on a mission to share profoundly insightful sleep conversations with global visionaries that merge together functional medicine and ancient wisdom. Breathe in bliss through weekly guided meditations and let yourself enter the land of dreams. Together, let's unravel the pieces, get to the roots and understand the right tools to transform your sleep completely. Through this podcast, I want you to dream the best version of yourself. It's time to regain hope and begin your sleep journey. Hey Stephanie, welcome back to the Sleep Whisperer podcast and um, we're talking about adrenal fatigue. Now, adrenal fatigue is a term that is used so much in the naturopathic or the functional world maybe in other areas not as much and I know there's a lot of misconception as well because sometimes in the medical model you do have people who don't think there's anything called adrenal fatigue and they're looking more at pathogenic adrenal disorders and not looking at the gap and that's what we're talking into because there can be suboptimal function of any any system in our body which can cause havoc Uh, so when we're talking about adrenal fatigue um, first of all I must ask you have you personally experienced this I know that I must have experienced this for years Uh, so let's talk a little bit about that yeah I absolutely experienced adrenal fatigue and it's interesting um, on the other episode I was on speaking into anxiety they very much go hand in hand and um, there was a point in my life where I was so exhausted that I was having to take a nap in my car at work every day um, that I couldn't even get through the work day without having to take a nap. Um, You know, again, being a mom and having so many responsibilities and my background is as a physician assistant And, you know, I was working 12 hour shifts, commuting two hours a day, and then going home and taking care of three kids, and then also managing, you know, a relationship. Um, It's a lot. And after, after a few years of living in that very fast paced, stressful lifestyle, I just completely tanked. And it's interesting that you said that most providers are looking at a pathological adrenal condition because in my experience as a PA before myself, I didn't diagnose anyone with adrenal fatigue in my 11 years working as a PA. It was nothing that was even brought to our attention in our schooling, that this was a thing. And after myself experiencing it and coming out of it, it was very clear to see how many other people really are suffering with this and they're not getting the help that they need because it's not being diagnosed correctly. It's, um, well, you know, a ton of labs are done and nothing really comes up. 
and then they're just left being tired without any answers. So let's let's break that down, Stephanie, because I think this is really important. Now, when you say a ton of labs are done and we're not we're not really able to identify it. What's typically the labs that are done and um, where we can miss adrenal fatigue? And if your labs came back normal, how did you realize that you had adrenal fatigue? Was it diagnosed by somebody very specific? Yeah, so usually if someone was complaining of fatigue, they would get um, a whole host of labs done and some that may show some imbalances like iron or vitamin D or their hemoglobin, um, B12, all of these things can certainly cause fatigue. But if we're talking specifically about adrenal fatigue, you really want to be looking at the cortisol level levels and specifically the salivary cortisol levels. A lot of times providers in uh, Western medicine, at least, they'll just order a serum cortisol but that's not helpful. Um, we want to see the salivary cortisol again and charting on the cortisol curve. So what does it look like at 10 a.m., 12 p.m., 4 p.m., and at midnight? And how does that relate to the different stages of adrenal fatigue? For myself, um, I had all those labs done and nothing really showed up. I was almost hoping at times like, oh, maybe it's my thyroid. You know, so many women blame it on their thyroid. Like, oh, I must be hypothyroid. This is why I'm so tired. And honestly, it was more just my own personal determination to heal that I was able to discover this about myself and really put in the work to undo this and really nurture my body what it needed. And Stephanie, I mean, you you describe the salivary cortisol. I'm not sure that it's done very frequently for sure, because I'm sure it's missed a lot in the medical model. And it also seems a little logistically challenging to be, how do we take that at midnight is what I can hear our listeners thinking about. Yeah, uh, especially this being a sleep podcast. Uh, I am also very strict about my sleep. Like no one wake me up unless it's an emergency. <laughs> um, but yeah, you would have to get up at midnight and do that because again, the cortisol, it's normally produced in a pattern each day. So it's low in the morning and then gradually increases around 10 a.m. It hits its highest to give us our energy for the day. And then it should slowly start to decline. So the where your cortisol levels are at can tell us which stage you're in of adrenal fatigue because there are three different stages and each of them does come with a different sort of treatment. So let's talk about these three stages of yeah. adrenal fatigue and how can we know if where we are and is there a way that we can recover from all of them? Yeah. So at its basis, I mean, adrenal fatigue is basically the body's loss of resiliency due to the presence of a repeated stressor. And um, these stressors can be a whole host of things. So again, parenting, divorce, um, unhealed emotional trauma, um, financial stress, poor sleep, blood sugar imbalances, um, being a perfectionist, even death of a loved one. So a lot of different things cause stress to the body. It's not just emotional stress. It also is stress in, done in part to the body. So over-exercising, under-eating, like I said. So um, stage one, if you were looking at the cortisol results, you would generally see elevated cortisol levels throughout the day. So this is there in that... Um, elevated state. So they may not even be tired yet. There's still a lot of stuff happening to them. They're still in this very um, activated sympathetic state, but they still have their cortisol reserves. So it really depends on your cortisol bank account and how you're feeling. So in this first stage, again, cortisol levels are elevated. 
they are just jazzed through the day. They may or may not be getting a little tired, but they seem to be adapting pretty well. So, um, in the, yeah. so let me stop you, Stephanie. So does that mean when you said they still have their reserves and it might not be dipping as yet? So what does that, could it, does it feel like having too much adrenaline? Because I've been in that state where I feel that yeah. I just can't wind down and everything's buzzing in me. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's, um, again, going back to the, the other episode in the chronic sympathetic activation. So yeah, your heart is, might be racing, feel like it's racing all day. Your breathing might be, um, shallow and rapid. You may have a lot of racing thoughts. You're just, you're going. Um, so, but the unfortunate or maybe the fortunate thing is that what goes up must come down. So going into stage two, now you may see low cortisol levels um, in the morning and then they're blunted the rest of the day. So this is when people are starting to lose those reserves. Um, so there's the, the repeated stressor and the cortisol bank account has been overdrawn during times of the day. So, um, the person will have daily fatigue and will generally get worse as the day progresses. So I definitely lived here for a long time. Like I said, I had to take a nap every afternoon in my car. And at this point, the adrenal glands are really starting to become impacted. And the adrenals also produce other hormones, um, aldosterone, which is important for water and salt balance, um, testosterone, which is certainly important for um, fertility and sex drive, um, and then other stress hormones, you know, adrenaline, norepinephrine, and other sex hormones. So at this point, you can have weight changes, um, hunger, recurrent infections, um, joint pain, infertility, low libido, blood pressure issues, depression, lightheaded, um, anxiety. So that's when, um, these other um, symptoms can start manifesting now that the cortisol uh, levels are starting to decline and the adrenals are becoming impacted. Um, so that is stage two. So, and then moving to three, stage three adrenal fatigue, this is when you'll see cortisol levels flatlined all day long. So they're just at a flat line. These people don't have any get up and go. At this point, a nap or a vacation will not suffice. I saw this many times in my practice as a PA, and I would willingly write people leaves of work and say, you cannot go back to work for three months. Like you need to just check out for a bit because this isn't serving you and you're healing and nothing is going to get accomplished if you're still in this stressful environment going through all the motions. So this is when someone really needs to start um, removing the stressors from their life and really just take a step back and heal. Let's talk about healing, Stephanie, because I do want us to talk about healing in these different stages. I'm sure they look a little different in the three stages, but Let's talk first overall about what does recovery from adrenal fatigue look like? And then we can go a little bit into each of these phases because I'm assuming that in the third stage, it must be way harder to recover. Or you need more rest, more time. So let's talk about that. Yeah, there definitely are a few non-negotiables for all of the phases. And as I just mentioned, I feel one of the most important steps is removing those stressors from your life. So first off, identifying what is it that is causing you stress in your life and how can you move away from it? So if you're very unhappy in your job, then you need to start looking at finding a new job. Um, if for me, it was a multitude of things, it, but one of them was my job and being very dissatisfied as my career and as a PA and practicing medicine in a way I just, I didn't feel as though authentically aligned with who I was. So once I removed myself from that, that was one of the biggest and pivotal parts in my healing journey is just getting out of that rat race. So finding out what the stressors are and 
than removing them from your life. Um, other really big things would be sleep. Absolutely. <laughs> so you're going to need a lot of it. And I would say sleep by, I mean, 9, 9.30, 10 p.m., like the absolute latest. Like I, I am in bed actively trying to go to sleep by 9.30 p.m. And that's just a non-negotiable for me. Like I'm not interested in staying up later. Um, my family knows that. And I so, just, I sleep, Stephanie, by 8 o'clock and I'm fast asleep yeah. by 8.15. I love that. I love sleeping. It's one of my favorite pastimes to sleep. So yeah, sleep has to be a top priority and you have to get your family on board too and letting them know that you are healing from something and it's going to take time and you're really going to need a lot of extra help and support. So if that means, okay, every day at 4 p.m., mom needs to lay down and take a half hour nap before dinner, then everyone needs to be on board and be supportive of that so that you can heal. Um, other things that are really important would be, um, as far as diet goes, so having a whole foods diet and not, um, no restrictive diets. I know here, at least in the U S, um, uh, intermittent fasting, things like that have become really popular and they can be very helpful in certain situations. However, if your body's already in a stress state and you're putting more stress on it, it may not be the best fit and can make healing a lot harder. Likewise, exercise. I was a former marathon runner before I knew that I was literally running away from all of my emotions. <laughs> um, that was not serving me. That was putting more, again, exercise puts, does put stress on the body. But when you're already in a stress state, it's going to just impede healing. So now I walk and do yoga and my body feels good. Um, and then the other big thing would be no caffeine, which is really hard to break that cycle too, or it can be when you're so exhausted and you have all these responsibilities and you feel like it's the only thing that can get you through the day when really it's making things much worse. When your body is tired, it's because you need rest, not because you need to stimulate it with more caffeine. Um, so that's where if you were able to take a leave of absence or something or take some things off your plate and you didn't need to be stimulated uh, to remove yourself from that could be really helpful. And I do want us to break this down a little bit more in the three different stages because uh, I can hear our listeners thinking about how different stage one and three look. They seem to be almost the opposite of each other. In the stage one, we're kind of hyper alert and aroused. And then in the third stage, we're depleted. So how do, how do, we, do we navigate this differently? Yeah, um, for sure. So the state there, there can be also some really great supportive supplements that can be good for each stage as well, too. And certainly as you progress, it does get a little more intense, the treatment plan. But for the first stage, I would really just focus on rest. So at this point, you haven't had other body systems impacted, or clearly not to the point where you know, you have low blood pressure or a rapid heart rate. Um, but I would really just focus on rest. Absolutely. In the first stage. So taking a nap, um, getting extra sleep on the weekends, trying to make that time for rest. And again, as we mentioned before, dropping into that parasympathetic state. Um, once we get into the second stage where there's a lot more happening, you really want to pay heed to those body systems. So if we're talking about electrolyte balance, you know, replacing electrolytes and getting some electrolytes in your water, um, replacing your salt, um, getting lots of good vitamins and minerals in your diet. And I mean, diet is crucial in any stage, but particularly here, if we're talking about adrenal health, we want to make sure that we're getting lots of great minerals and electrolytes in our foods and drinks. Um, 
I love adaptogens and these could be helpful, um, particularly in the second and third stage. And even in the first stage, any of these things can apply so that you don't progress to the other stages. But adaptogens, if you're unfamiliar, they are a group of um, different um, herbs and plants. So maca is my, one of my favorite adaptogens, and it is a root that grows on top of the Andy Mountains where no plant life should exist. So these plants have adapted to thrive in very harsh environments. So when we consume them, it gives our bodies the same resiliency to, to handle stressful situations. So I love maca. I put it in my dandelion tea, others ashwagandha, um, rhodiola. You can play with them. They come in tinctures too. Again, I'm just super partial to my maca dandelion tea and I drink it every day. Um, so bringing in adaptogens in addition to the clean diet and sleep is really instrumental. And then moving on to the third stage, again, this is where you may need to ask for a leave of absence if you have a job and that's what's causing you stress. You may need to consider your relationship if that's causing you a lot of stress um, and really getting a lot of support from those in your family or in your in your circle and letting them know that you're really going to need some extra help in these next few months or whatnot until you are feeling a little bit closer back to baseline um, and really just focusing on rest as much as possible. Beautiful, Stephanie. I wanted to just close with Speaking a little bit more about the sleep, uh, about food, since you said whole foods diet. So let's describe that plate. What does that look like at breakfast, at lunch? And maybe you could give us some, an option for uh, a plant based meal and an omnivore meal. Yeah. Um, so a good rule of thumb is, you know, if it's in a box or a package, it's probably not a whole food. <laughs> so really focusing on fresh, um, ideally organic fruits and vegetables, um, beans or legumes, things that aren't going to disrupt your blood sugar either. So, um, you know, anything processed or refined is going to disrupt your blood sugar. And that's something that also is impacted in adrenal fatigue. You, de you generally do have blood sugar imbalances. So, um, so myself, I am vegan, so I could just walk you through like what I eat for a day. Um, yeah. So you could start, yeah, you could start your day with a, a dense nourishing smoothie. Mine has um, coconut oil, coconut butter, peanut butter. And then um, collagen peptides and some frozen blueberries in it. And then cinnamon, which is really great for blood sugar balancing. So I focus a lot on fats in my diet um, for my healing, my personal healing journey in relation to my anxiety as well, because fats are uh, imperative for brain health. So that starts my day off. And then I have my dandelion and maca tea. And then for lunch, a really great plant-based meal would be some steamed like cabbage with carrots, broccoli, um, some beans like edamame or a different um, carbohydrate like lentils. You want to focus on um, carbohydrates that aren't going to, again, give you a very quick blood sugar spike like rice or white potatoes, although good they are a higher glycemic food. So um, slower releasing like beans or lentils, legumes with like a tahini dressing, again, a fat. And then mid afternoon, I'll generally have um, a piece of fruit, maybe with a nut butter um, or a handful of nuts. And then evening again, I generally just make a huge salad with some roasted veggies with some nuts. I'll have another um, protein shake for dinner. And um, maybe before bed, I'll have something sweet with some dark chocolate or um, some um, like nut butters that I've made. Basically, peanut butter is my favorite food. So I, I eat a lot of nut butter. 
And I do want you to clarify because you said you are a vegan, but you mentioned the collagen. So if you could just clarify oh, yes. to us. Yeah, so I guess I am vegan with the exception of the collagen peptides. Um, I really like the... Um, I like how it gives so many of the essential amino acids um, and something that I haven't found in maybe some of the other plant-based, the amount of protein. And I feel like as a mostly vegan that I do consume a lot of protein, but I think it's really eye-opening if you ever track your food. I thought I was eating far more protein than what I really was, even with the collagen peptides and having a pretty high um, protein content. So, um, but I, I, even myself, I know that I need to bump it up a little bit more. So anyways, that's why I use those because they do have a pretty high amount of protein per serving. And they also supply, I think, eight of the nine essential amino acids. And I know we've discussed collagen a few times, but so if somebody were to wish to be completely vegan, plant-based, what are your thoughts if they leave out that collagen? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great um, plant-based um, protein powders for sure. Um, my kids actually, I have them use Truvani, which is a completely plant-based protein powder. Um, and I think you also just have to see what feels right for your body. And I know for myself personally, I've thought about eating meat again. I haven't yet. Um, but I personally just like to experiment from time to time. And I guess I've been on this vegetarian vegan experiment for close to a decade now. So I'm not saying that I will ever rule it out again. Um, I think if my body needs it, I'll know and then I'll eat it. But for right now, I'm feeling pretty good where I'm at. I love that, Stephanie. I think we should just be always looking at understanding when we might need something different, be open to changing that so we can heal ourselves. And uh, I love that final takeaway. So where can just remind us where can people find you if they'd like to work with you or look at your work? Yeah, absolutely. On Instagram at The Functional Healer or my website online, www.thefunctionalhealer.com. Great. Great to have you back on the show, Stephanie. And thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. In this episode, Stephanie took us through the three stages of adrenal fatigue. And I wanted to end by making the connection between adrenal fatigue and ancient Eastern wisdom. In Ayurveda, the nervous system and adrenal function are related to vata dosha. Vata aggravation symptoms correlate with symptoms of adrenal fatigue. It is vata imbalance that then drives other doshas to imbalance very quickly. And this then correlates to how adrenal function has an influential relationship with several other systems, organs and hormones. One of the most profound ways that we calm down vata dosha is by not overdoing and overstretching ourselves. Having clear boundaries of rest time and switching off all stimulation appropriately is the key. Sounds simple? Most of us are guilty of not putting this into practice. Experiment with that clear boundary of removing mental stimulation and notice what it does for you. Have a great day. This podcast is intended to provide helpful and informative material on the subject matter covered in the episodes. The podcast is not acting in the capacity of a doctor or a registered dietitian and is not rendering any professional healthcare or medical service. The information in the podcast is not intended as a substitute for medical advice or services or as treatment or cure for any particular health condition. The advice and tools contained herein may not be suitable for your situation 
any medical questions regarding contraindications and cautions or any questions on whether or not to proceed with any practices provided in the show should be referred to qualified health professionals before adopting the same the podcast specifically disclaims any responsibility for any liability loss risk personal or otherwise which may be incurred as a direct or indirect consequence of the use of information from this podcast or the application adoption of any of the information provided